before talking about the gospel this week, um, um, to say a few words about the news story that you may have seen about the uh, scandal of priest abuse of children in Pennsylvania and the covering up that took place in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. These are certainly serious sins that caused grave harm to children and young people. Never acceptable uh, to uh, do these things. We have instituted for many years now in our church safe environment practices for the protection of young people. You may have heard it's called the Virtus Program in which all the priests are trained and all those working with youth and young people to respond and report possible abuse and there's a zero tolerance now for any kind of abuse. The formation in seminary is much different now than it was in the 50s and 60s. Sometimes the response and the temptation is to say, I don't want to be associated with this by being Catholic. But we realize that there has been scandal uh, in the church since the beginning with the betrayal of one of the 12 apostles of Judas and the other apostles denying him and running off. Jesus himself says the weeds and the wheat will be allowed to grow side by side in the church and only sort it out at the end with the desire for conversion. But the deeper response, I think, is looking at Jesus himself, who, rather than shrinking and, and wanting nothing to do with sinners, identified himself with sinners. He was not afraid to be thought of as a criminal himself. And that's what he is, was accused of, though he was innocent. He took sin upon himself so that we could be forgiven. And St. John Bosco, in writing about the compassion of Jesus, says, Jesus put up with the ignorance and roughness of the apostles and even their infidelity. He treated sinners with a kindness and affection that caused some to be shocked, others to be scandalized, and still others to hope for God's mercy. This is really the message of the gospel, the good news, that our world is not able to recognize. The world does not recognize mercy, that there is hope of forgiveness for all of us. Jesus calls people to conversion. Mercy doesn't mean it condones sinful behavior but it says we can be forgiven by the grace of God. In the Gospel, Jesus continues to teach us about the Eucharist, and uh, he concludes that next week we'll hear St. Peter say to Jesus, where else can we go? You have the words of everlasting life. In other words, our hearts are made for God, and we won't find peace until we find God. Our world offers many other things to try to bring peace to our hearts, but they are not effective. One of those is mentioned in the second reading today, and that is drinking alcohol. A lot of times we hear people say, I want to drown my sorrows. So there is an underlying pain for those who fall into the addiction of alcohol that still is there when they're sober in the morning. And this can be, uh, in our own souls, a lack of love, a woundedness, a rejection. None of those things can heal that, only Jesus alone. And so the, the second reading encourages us to be filled with the Spirit instead, to sing and play to the Lord in your hearts. What a great experience that is to have in our soul that experience of, of being filled with love. Maybe we've had those moments in our life of a glimpse of that, of knowing how deep God's love is for us. If we knew how much God loved us, we would weep with tears of joy. There'd really be nothing that we would have to worry about. And so that's our desire, is to be filled with love. That is to say, to be filled with the Spirit. How can we receive the Spirit of God so that he remains in us? Jesus gives us the way. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him.
It is not the dead flesh of Jesus that we receive in the Eucharist, but the living Lord himself, a person, a person who is love. When we come up for communion, we want to remind ourselves and refresh in our minds this gift that Jesus has given to us. It's not a thing. It's not even the dead flesh of Jesus. It is the living Lord, the Holy Spirit of God, love itself that we are receiving. It is a spiritual gift mostly, but we have access by the physical act of eating the Eucharist. And so we may ask, how is it that I can receive communion with no real change in my life? It means there needs to be spiritual preparation in order to receive communion. In other words, not just going through the motions, but preparing ourselves for this gift of love of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we surround communion with prayers, reflection on the word of, a word of God at Mass, and a, a relationship with Jesus of faith. To pray, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. It's one thing for God to tell you that he loves you from a distance, but it's another thing for him to come near and to be with you, to remain in your very hearts, which is what the Lord desires by giving himself to us in the Eucharist. So the Eucharist really is the presence of Christ. A couple of stories to illustrate this. Uh, the, once in a while, there are miracles that happen to help us to know in our faith that Jesus is really there in the Eucharist. One story was Pope John Paul was visiting a, a seminary in Boston, and he wanted to go pray in the chapel there. And they said, that's not on your itinerary. We haven't prepared the place to make sure it's safe for you to go in there. And so he said, it doesn't matter. I want to go pray in the chapel. And so quickly they had to uh, check the place out and make sure it was safe for the Pope and no one hiding or anything like that. And they had these special dogs that were trained to recognize the presence of a human being. So if someone was hiding in a corner, the dogs would find them. They took these dogs into the chapel at the seminary and they immediately went to the tabernacle and began to bark, indicating there's a human being there. So the dogs recognized the presence of Jesus, at least in his human nature, uh, in the Eucharist. Another one was a Eucharistic miracle that happened in Argentina in 1996 in the diocese of Pope Francis before he was elected. There was a host that was dropped on the floor and was soiled, and so they began to dissolve it in water in order to dispose of it in the aquarium. But after a few days, it didn't dissolve. It looked like it turned red, and there was like a, a piece of flesh there or something. So they sent it in to a biologist and a specialist in human biology to examine without telling him what it was. And they said, what is this? Just tell us what it is. Analyze it. And he wrote back and said, it is tissue from a heart muscle of a human heart. And it looks like someone who has been uh, submitted to extreme stress, maybe even tortured. And normally, when you put heart tissue in water, the, it kills the cells, but these cells are still attempting to beat. Where, where did you get this? What is this? And then they told him it was from the Eucharist. These are, uh, there's hundreds of stories, though, about Eucharistic miracles, but they are there to help us in our faith that the Eucharist really is Jesus Christ. A change of substance from the, uh, from the substance of bread to become the body of Christ. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. It still has the appearances of bread. It still looks like bread, but that's not what it is. It is Jesus. So we, we are invited then to spend time in prayer with Jesus the Lord. He lifts our hearts and takes our worries and calms our fears. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him.